The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon One and All. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I am your host. I am your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction, and fiction is truly reality. The Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern on the Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, iHeartRadio, and of course the Exxon Broadcast Network, as well as now on Simul Radio. And if you'd like to watch the TV show version of our broadcast on the Exxon TV channel, just go to www.simultv.com. That is the only place where you can watch the Exxon TV channel. 724 365 with paranormal programming from around the world. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Stephen Browdy. Uh, he is uh, an emeritus professor and former chair of philosophy at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is a past president of the Parapsychological Association, editor in chief of the Journal of Scientific Exploration, and the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including a fellowship from the National Endowment for Humanities, and the prestigious F.W.H. Myers Memorial Medal from the Society for Psychical Research. His earliest research was in logic and philosophic philosophies of language and time. After that, he shifted focus to the evidence for psychic phenomenon to see if it would provide new insights into traditional problems in the philosophy of science and the philosophy of the mind. Joining me now is Stephen Browdy. And Stephen, welcome to the Exxon. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It's my great pleasure, sir. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us what was it that intrigued you into investigating the paranormal or researching, I should say. Well, it's an embarrassing story, actually. Oh. It all began back in graduate school when I considered myself to be a kind of hard-nosed materialist. Mm -hmm. Not for any particularly good reason. It was just the kind of intellectual conceit I was cultivating in those days. And it was a slow day in Northampton, Massachusetts, and a couple of friends came over. We'd seen the only movie in town. And they said, let's play this game called Table Up. What they meant was, let's have a seance. Now, none of us knew anything about parapsychology, but mm -hmm. my friends had played this so-called game a number of times. And they said when it worked, it was a lot of fun. So for the next three hours, to my astonishment and horror, actually... Uh, in my own house with my own table, I saw my table tilt up and down without any means of support as far as I could determine. We were standing next to the table. Uh, if one of my friends left to go to the other room, mm -hmm. it would still rise under our fingers. It was rising in the wrong direction to be explained in terms of muscular movement. But I didn't know anything about parapsychology. I was busy writing a dissertation on temporal logic. I didn't want to screw up my budding philosophical career. Right. So I knew I couldn't really talk to my mentors about this, so I put it out of mind until I finished my PhD, got mm -hmm. a job, and got tenure. And by that time, I had made something of a reputation for myself doing logic and the philosophy of language. And I realized at that point, given the joys of academic freedom that tenure was supposed to provide, that 
if I was an honest philosopher and intellect, I needed to really come to grips with this thing that had happened back in grad school. And I knew at that point that some important philosophers had taken parapsychology seriously. So I read what they had to say. I decided that, indeed, there was really something worth sinking my teeth into. And so I started investigating it for myself. And after a while, cranked out six books. Wow. What kind of uh, or what sorts of cases have you uh, focused on? Well, I'm a psychokinesis junkie. Um, I, I learned fairly early on that certain kinds of cases are not very easy to investigate if you don't have unlimited budget and time. Right. And it may not come as a surprise to you that the University of Maryland did not have provisions in its philosophy budget for paranormal case investigations. So that meant doing haunting investigations or poltergeist investigations was really not a smart use of my time. But if I could find people who claimed and really seemed to have the ability to make objects move on demand, then this would be not only dramatic evidence, but it was something worth investigating. And by the time I reached that understanding, I had already written a couple books in parapsychology, including one on macro PK, macro psychokinesis, really large scale stuff, mostly from the uh, heyday of the spiritist movement in the mid to late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so that's the kind of stuff I've been chasing after. So I've investigated mediums of various kinds who mm -hmm. can make tables apparently levitate and make objects move at a distance. I investigated a woman in Florida whose body would break out in a kind of golden colored foil instantaneously and near at hand. And those are among the best cases I've investigated. How did you uh, reason the, or how did you explain the, the gold leaf lady? <laughs> Well, I don't know how to explain it in terms of what's going on physically. Right. I mean, there are two leading scientific explanations or quasi-scientific explanations. One would be that it's a materialization. It's something that she's creating de novo, just out of nothing, seemingly. The other possibility is that it's what's known as an apport, where something is moved from one location and reappears somewhere else. So huh. there are lots of similarities between apports and materializations, right. but the basic difference is that in materializations, things are created anew, and mm -hmm. in apports, they're just moved. But what I believe I can explain is what was going on psychologically. I think I understand the psychogenesis of the phenomena. And what I'd say about that is that the woman in this case, her name is Katie. In many ways, she's a classic poltergeist victim. And what we know about poltergeist victims is that although they're usually teenagers or adolescents, um, they're not always so. And the received view about poltergeist victims or agents is that they have all these intense emotions and no convenient, conventional way of expressing them. And so they come out as kind of brute psychic flailings about and things will shatter, fly around and so on. Now, it's not just teenagers or adolescents who have deep emotional problems. It's, marriages are fertile grounds for those too, as I can personally attest. And Katie's psychic abilities, which are considerable and uh, and many, uh, didn't emerge until her second marriage, which by all accounts has been a very difficult marriage. And so she started out having poltergeist-like phenomena occurring around her. Objects were rearranging themselves, appearing and disappearing. And one day, a carving set appeared out of nowhere. And her husband said to her, well, what good is it if it isn't money? Wow. And then two days later, her body started to break out in this golden colored foil. Now, what you need to know is that the foil was not really gold, it's brass. So, symbolically, this satisfies Katie's husband's demand for producing something valuable, but she doesn't really have to bear the responsibility of being the goose that laid the golden egg, which I think would be a pretty weighty responsibility. And I also think it's a way of uh, subtly expressing her rage against her husband because she's not really giving him what he wanted. He wanted something valuable and she's giving him fool's gold. You know, she's giving him the psychic <laughs> finger. How do you, how do you explain that? The manifestation of, of, of brass, the movement of a table, the manifestation of, of a carving uh, set of knives. How do we explain that in today's technological age? 
Well, I think the temptation is always to look for an analytical explanation that mm -hmm. is in terms of some underlying processes, more or less in the way in which we explain heat as molecular motion. Right. But I think that's there's a deep philosophical issue here, and the issue is this. Most scientists assume that explanation by analysis in terms of underlying processes can't go on indefinitely, that sooner or later you're going to reach a kind of ground level where you have primitive phenomena, phenomena that you can't go behind and look for lower level phenomena that explain them. And I think that's right. That doesn't mean that all explanation comes to an end. It just means that analytical explanation comes to an end. Some phenomena presumably are fundamental. Now, that seems to me perfectly okay, but what scientists usually assume in addition is that wherever this lowest level of phenomena occur, mm -hmm. it's always at the level of the very small, the atomic, subatomic, neurological, biochemical, but never at the observable level. But there's a massive philosophical literature to suggest that that's wrong. I call that assumption the smallest beautiful assumption. All right, stand and by, Stephen. We've got to take our first break for this hour. Exonation, Nation, our guest this hour is Stephen Browdy. And uh, the website is jazzphilosopher.com. That's www.jazzphilosopher.com. And Stephen and I will return after this commercial break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast station, studios, and offices here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. <laughs> Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x -Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x -Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV. Plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is. But you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at SimulTV.com. Do it today. We live in rapidly shifting times of extreme volatility and uncertainty. Such profound change brings a unique opportunity for the evolution of consciousness. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio Show, a program that explores the latest scientific developments and deepening spiritual truths supporting human evolution. Join me on xzbn.net, where I interview leading experts in science, physics, medicine, spirituality, and more. By applying divergent viewpoints to leading-edge topics, we uncover expansive and evolutionary truth to assist you on your path to enlightenment. More information and past episodes are available at missionevolution.org.
Welcome back, everyone. Stephen Browdy is our special guest at this hour. And um, his website is jazzphilosopher.com. Have you investigated anything that, or any event that many reported to be real, but turned out to be fraudulent? Oh, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. It, it, obviously, it has me choked up. <clears throat> <laughs> I investigated a, a medium in Germany. This is Las Vegas uh, throat, so pardon me. It's all right. <clears throat> a medium in Germany named Kai Muga, who's a physical medium. Mm -hmm. um, he's what's known to many as a mixed medium. That is, some of his phenomena, I believe, are genuine and some are not. It's a phenomenon I think I understand. There can be many reasons, especially if you're making a living doing mediumistic things, that you might sometimes need to help the phenomena along. But I investigated Kai over a series – over several years, and I've observed some things that were pretty impressive. I mean, for example, objects were moving at a distance from him, way out of arm's reach while I was draped all over him. That is, I was controlling both right. his arms and legs and mm -hmm. almost lying in, on his lap. Nevertheless, things were moving at a distance. You're I've quite observed a some pretty impressive table levitations mm -hmm. uh, where tables were not only levitating fully, but they'd be aloft for like 20 seconds and were swaying back and forth to the rhythm of music that was playing in the background. On the other hand, so we know that Kai has cheated on some occasions – and some of his phenomena are very suspicious. I tested him in Austria over a series of seances. And we got some interesting phenomena, including a good table levitation. But we weren't able to fully convince ourselves that the ectoplasm that he was pulling out of his mouth hadn't been concealed somewhere else, even though I did a strip search of him. I mean, I don't know how deeply you want to get into this. I didn't do a full cavity search. And the reason mm -hmm. that's relevant is, well, first of all, I didn't do a full cavity search because that really doesn't fall within my areas of expertise. And it's it matters because there was a Hungarian medium at one point, and I gather there have been others, who actually was hiding various sorts of things in his rectum and could retrieve them and then put them back later on. That just didn't wreck him. It nearly killed him. <laughs> it didn't kill him, but uh, uh, he apparently was unusually versatile. I would imagine. Um, why do people get conned? You know, not well, people yeah. want to believe. Is is that what it is? Is is it all because we want to believe there's more to this existence than we can see, feel, hear, and touch? I think for many people that is surely the reason. Um, and it's understandable. I mean, especially if the phenomena in question bear on the issue of survival of bodily death. Because I think in our heart of hearts, most of us want to believe that this physical life is not the end of all things and that maybe after uh, we die physically, we'll be able to reunite with our friends or – uh, take vengeance on our enemies, or right. if maybe just get our hair back. You know, hence the the uh, the creation of heaven and hell. Yes. How do you think people communicate with those on the other side, those who have passed? Do you believe that I'm, is possible? I'm certainly open to it. Uh, one of my books was on the evidence for. Uh, survival of bodily death. And my own position is that it depends which day you ask me. Okay, that's fair uh, enough. And and the reason I say that is there are various alternate explanations that we have to consider, and some of which are extremely difficult to rule out. The one that's most difficult to mm -hmm. rule out is the hypothesis that the phenomena are all produced by psychic functioning among the living that just simulates the evidence of survival. And it's very difficult to rule that out because if even if you believe that post-mortem survival occurs and there's evidence for it, 
you need to suppose that the very same kind and same degree of psychic functioning is going on between the dead and the living. So, for example, if a medium claims to be in touch with my deceased Uncle Harry, and Uncle Harry says um, to me through the medium Mm -hmm. that he's glad to know that uh, I'm happy in my new job. Now, if I hadn't spoken about my new job, you need to consider, well, how does the deceased Uncle Harry know what I'm thinking? That has to be explained in terms of pretty good telepathy. And how does the medium know what uh, Uncle Harry is saying? That also has to be explained in terms of telepathy. So, and in addition to that, if the medium provides verifiable information, I mean, if Uncle Harry says, there's a secret will that I hid in a secret compartment in my desk, and nobody alive knew about that by normal means, and we can verify that, then that very same information was available to us through clairvoyance. So it's virtually impossible to rule out the living agent psychic functioning explanation or alternative explanation for survival. Years ago, I had a psychic, uh, a medium come on the show. And uh, we came back from a commercial break, and she said, Rob, I have a message for you from the other side. I said, could you share it? Certainly, on air, with your audience listening? I said, I have nothing to hide from my audience. So she said, all right. The message is from a young lady, your, your sister, who is on the other side. And she wants me to tell you that she's with you all the time. And she went on and painted a beautiful picture over the next six and a half minutes. And then I had to break the bad news to her that I'd never had a sister. (laughs) And at the time, we were using a shotgun and a toilet flush to say goodbye to guests that we found anything but credulous. Um, (laughs) and, And another thing, we used to go to all the psychic fairs between Toronto. Oh my gosh, we went to Ottawa. We went to uh, Kingston. We went all over Ontario, even down to Las Vegas, Florida, doing the show from these different psychic events. And after a while, you get to see the same psychics at the same fairs. And I would see the, the same people go from one psychic to the next, one psychic to the next, one psychic to the next, until they went to a psychic and they walked away out of the psychic fair. And I learned later on that this was because they got the answer that they wanted from the fifth psychic. How can a, how can anyone know who is legitimate when it comes to soothsayers or practitioners of any divination within the paranormal, and who's a con? Well, for one thing, if they're not giving you any verifiable information, Mm -hmm. which nobody has normal access to, um, then you don't even know if they're genuinely psychic at all, whether or not their information is coming from the deceased. So the kind of message you got is really mm -hmm. useless. Right, but if you're one of those people, I'm a skeptic. You know, I'm a journalist. I'm an ex-police investigator. I want proof. I want evidence. Um, if, If I cannot touch, see, feel, smell any of the actual physical evidence... To me, it's it goes into the category of, hmm. But with today's today's technology, getting information is very easy. But what I have learned is that the power of belief is the strongest power in the universe. And there are those who want to believe so bad, Stephen, that they're willing to take anything that a psychic says and then try and fit what the psychic says into their life. Yes. And there's not much you can do about that. I mean, you can't reason people out of positions they haven't been reasoned into, and there's only so much you can do about total credulity or stupidity. Right. That's very true. Have you done any investigation on spiritual healings? Uh, Some. I don't know a whole lot about that, but Mm -hmm. I used to know a very famous healer who lived in the Baltimore area named Olga Worrell. And... I've seen Olga do some pretty remarkable really? healings, and I know there have been other accounts 
what's very hard to know what it's very hard to know what's going on in those cases. It's not like you can actually trace the causal lines here right. with a meter of some sort. So you don't know whether you're dealing again with the power of belief and what really amounts to being a placebo effect, or whether it's something that is being done through the efficacy of the healer, and whether even the efficacy of prayer is a real thing. All right, these Steve. are very hard to know. Stephen, stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation. Stephen Browdy is our special guest this hour. His website is jazzphilosopher. Dot com. Now, the Exxon, uh, I'm sorry, the Ex Chronicles newspaper is available for one and all with our compliments at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. We've been publishing it monthly since 1990. Right now, it's 92 full pages in color. You can read it online and you can download it. You can even go on to Amazon.com and buy a printed copy. That's the Ex Chronicles newspaper, www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. Broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media. Day. You have heard of the Exxon? Now watch it on Simul TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world, interactive online network, and much more. Tomorrow's TV today, Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God, it was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. 
www.thepetshow.com. Exonation is Stephen Browdy is our special guest. His website is jazzphilosopher.com. And besides writing over 100 published articles, uh, Stephen has written six books, ESP and Psychokinesis, A Philosophical Examination, The Limits of Influence, Psychokinesis, and The Philosophy of Science, First uh, Person Plural, Multiple Personality, and The Philosophy of the Mind, Immortal Remains, The Evidence for Life After Death, and The Gold Leaf Lady, and Other Parapsychological Investigations. Once again, www.jazzphilosopher.com. And his latest uh, book is Crimes of Reason. Tell us a little bit about Crimes of Reason, Reason, Stephen. That's a collection of uh, essays, which some of which are brand new and some of which are updates and minor revisions of what I believe are some of my better uh, articles. And it's the kind of book you get to write toward Mm -hmm. the end of your career where you want to bring things together and show connections between various uh, essays that otherwise might not be so apparent. But it deals with a lot of things. It deals with various philosophical problems about how we explain psychic phenomena or just any psychological phenomena, problems about... uh, paranormal research and why it's almost ludicrous to be doing laboratory research in parapsychology. That's one of the themes. Why are there not more scientists and researchers like yourself investigating the paranormal? Because it's a career kiss of death. I mean, that's why I think it turned out to be a very lucky, I can't say it was a smart thing, but Mm -hmm. it was a lucky thing that I didn't get into this until I got tenure. But but don't, don't scientists, philosophers, Researchers want to discover the undiscovered. Don't they want to explain the, the, the workings of the unexplainable? Well, look, I used to think so. Okay. I, used to, I used to think that philosophers and scientists in particular were committed to discovering the truth and that they'd even be happy to find out that they were mistaken so long as finding that out brought them closer to the truth. Right. But now I realize that that's a ridiculously idealized picture of things. I've even discovered that most academic and other professions are deficient in the one virtue that's supposed to characterize the field. I mean, so scientists aren't objective, philosophers aren't wise, psychologists aren't perceptive, psychiatrists are crazy, lawyers don't care about justice, physicians aren't healers, artists lack taste, historians lack perspective, and so on. Wow. You just uh, you just ruined everybody's life. Thank you very much for that. We'll speak to you next year or whenever you're. No, but we'll... you've got everybody now on the internet, which is the largest septic tank that man has ever created. It's full of misinformation. There's more crap in it than anything else. And you've got all these yahoos running around claiming to be ghost investigators, paranormal psychologists, or whatever. How do you, as a professional, deal with this? I just try to keep my own nose clean. Doesn't work. I mean, I'm, people are going to resort to guilt by association uh, no matter what I do. So they can't really very easily impugn my actual yep. work. They can only, uh, I think, impugn what I've done by associating me unfairly with people who do unsatisfactory work or just sleaze bags. What's your take on ghosts and hauntings? Well, I think there's some very intriguing evidence for ghosts and hauntings, though I don't consider it the strongest evidence Mm -hmm. for survival of bodily death because very seldom do you get anything that's verifiable and that gives us information that we couldn't have found out normally. There's a, a different kind of contemporary sort of evidence that I think is actually more interesting, and that's the evidence from heart-lung transplants. Do you know about that? No, share it with us. In many cases, uh, recipients of new hearts or lungs 
have taken on personality characteristics of the donor Mm -hmm. whom they knew nothing about. And some of these cases are particularly intriguing. So, for example, um, a young man received, uh, I think it was a heart transplant from a lesbian painter. And after the surgery, he suddenly developed an anomalous interest in art. Mm -hmm. He would spend hour after hour in art museums. He started carrying a purse. And his girlfriend reported that he started making love to her in a way that was completely different from the way they used to make love. And that seemed to suggest the knowledge of female anatomy that he had never displayed before. Oh, for a minute there, I thought you were talking about Bruce Jenner. <laughs> How do we explain this? Is, is it something to do with the, the introduction of the new cells into the body, that the cells of the organs that are being transplanted retain a memory of the existence of the, the original owner? I know a lot of people think that, but I actually believe that that explanation presupposes a totally incoherent view of how memory works. I have an even more exotic explanation. Okay, let's hear it. Um, What we say about hauntings is that these are cases which, if genuine, are cases where uh, departed individuals hover around a location that maybe was meaningful to them in their embodied life. So it seems to me that perhaps we can look at these transplant cases as instances where the deceased hover around their still living vital organs. And one of the cases I find particularly suggestive has to do with a young boy, a very young boy Mm -hmm. who received uh, a new heart from a, a tragically deceased another young boy. And, you know, Children who haven't yet been polluted by what adults tell them is real or possible may have a truer sense of what's really going on. And the way this young heart recipient described what was going on is that the deceased named Jerry was with him. And sometimes he would just give himself over to Jerry and let Jerry take control of the body. So, for example, when the young boy Carter was introduced to Jerry's parents for Mm -hmm. the first time, he he let Jerry take over, as he described it. And Jerry ran to the parents and nuzzled up the way that he used to. So it may be that this child was actually experiencing things more the way they are and not the way we'd like to think they are. Is it possible that the child was just happy to be alive and understood that if this was the these were the parents of the child who made it possible for him to live run that past me one more time all right you said that the child ran to the parents and yes. hugged them because he allowed jerry to take over his body i guess yes is it possible that the child in reality was just being thankful for the fact that this mother and father had Jerry and that thanks to Jerry, even though the loss of Jerry was was sad for the family, that because of Jerry's death, this child is alive and he was thankful. Well, you might think that, but what the parents found so mm-hmm. interesting about it was that <clears throat> Carter, the, young, the living young boy, nuzzled up to them in a way that was totally characteristic of what Jerry used to do. But isn't it also true that when when somebody has lost someone, that they start seeing a similarity in a lot of other people that, oh, uh, Jerry used to do it, or Jerry used to do it that way, or look, they're wearing the same kind of clothes that Jerry used to like wearing. You're absolutely right. It, it could be a lot of wishful thinking on the parents' part. Right. I still find it more interesting that, J- that this young boy, Carter, is the only heart-lung recipient I know of in these cases, <clears throat> to have described the phenomena in just this way. And we do know from other investigations that uh, children seem to lose their ESP abilities as the educational system strangles them. And so I'm inclined to give a, a certain degree of otherwise unexpected credence to what this young boy Carter had to say. The the part that you were saying where the the ghost, for a lack of better words, stays with his organs. 
or the living remains. Now, as I understand it, when somebody dies, their spirit, you know, goes anywhere. I, I don't know. Their soul. And people who are investigating the paranormal say, well, we never die because matter or, you know, matter cannot be destroyed. It can only change form and shape. Right. So how do we know that, or why is it possible, how is it possible that these, this matter that has been freed from the meat suit that we all wear would retain the memories, retain the size, remain the, you know, the, uh, you know, contain the statute and the ability to go where these parts are. That, that I find amazing. And, and it is amazing. Probable. And we have no idea what the afterlife is like. And different psychics give us sometimes dramatically different stories. The psychic I told you about, Olga Worrell, once said she saw my grandfather standing next to me, my mother's mm-hmm. father. I said, can you describe him? And she said, well, he's broad. And I said, okay. She said, and he has a beard. I said, he never used to have a beard. She said, well, he does now. He can have a beard if he wants. All right, stand by, my friend. You and I have to take our final break. Exonation. Nation, Stephen Brody is our special guest. And if you'd like to find out more about Stephen, his website is jazzphilosopher.com. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go on. <coughs> it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like Exxon, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Exposé Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades, there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. The concept of a new age has been around since the late 19th century, yet much of its original meaning has been lost. What exactly is the new age? Is it a religion? A collection of obscure esoteric practices? A series of doomsday predictions? Or an astrological event? The New Age Chronicles is a unique, complimentary publication bringing reason and grounded information to separate fact from fiction. Chuck full of valuable information to support you as we make the monumental shift into the new era. You won't want to miss a single innovative issue. The New Age Chronicles newspaper is coming soon to www.newagechronicles.com.
Stephen Browdy is my special guest this hour, Exo Nation. His uh, website is jazzphilosopher.com. First of all, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure talking to you, and uh, thank you for all the research and all the investigative work that you've done into the field of parapsychology. Well, thank you very much. Let me ask you something, Stephen. Um, have you, you've, you've, done, you've investigated uh, near-death experiences, not with the same vigor that I've investigated uh, psychokinetic phenomena. And the reason is mm-hmm. that it's very hard to investigate NDEs because you don't really – even if you get very interesting reports from the NDE about what transpired while they were presumably clinically dead, right? Uh, you can't really reliably time stamp when those experiences occurred, whether there was some residual uh, – bodily activity or cortical activity going on or when exactly was happening was it happening when they were just coming out of the most dead part of that clinical death and they weren't really dead anyway since we cannot depend on the scientific community and other professionals to to investigate the paranormal as you have how would you suggest that we investigate it if we do not use the uh, the old tried and true, according to the scientific community, of everything being replicated in the lab. Well, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, see, I think that laboratory research in parapsychology, although I think it has provided us with good evidence that something or other mm-hmm. psychic is going on, we can't really learn much from it because we have no idea what kind of real life capacity or ability we're trying to bring into the lab and whether it's even appropriate to bring it into the lab in the first place. I mean, psychic phenomena don't occur just for parapsychologists and they don't occur only when we set out to look for them. Presumably, our psychic abilities or capacities have some kind of natural history. They have some sort of ordinary stage of operation and that's it's those kind of spontaneous psychic experiences that drove researchers into the lab in the first place. So, I've often urged that what we really need to do is to find people who really are better at the kind of naturalistic investigation we need to do first to find out what kind of capacity our psychic functioning is and whether it's even appropriate to investigate it under laboratory conditions. There are lots of human capacities that we know are genuine and which can't really be studied uh, profitably in the lab, like wit or sensuality or – I mean – this is something that my students used to call the fart factor. I mean, there are all sorts of things we can do in real life, but not just mm-hmm. on demand. They're very situation sensitive. Right. Most of our capacities are situation sensitive. Even the capacity to produce endorphins, to resist pain, to breathe deeply. So I've often urged that what we really need to do is to start by looking at people who are unusually lucky or unlucky particularly unlucky people. There's a a well-known Yiddish distinction between a shlemiel and a shlemazel. A shlemiel is someone who spills soup on himself, and a shlemazel has it spilled on him. (laughs) So the idea is that shlemazels are these unlucky souls. They're victims of the universe at large or impersonal forces, and they really exist. I was actually married to a shlemazel at one point, and she was part of a family of shlemazels. And I even lived next door to a family of of Schlamazels, this couple. It seemed that they lived in a consumer hell. Everything they bought was defective. Electronic (laughs) equipment would fail to work right out of the box. Um, A solid wooden rocking chair broke within the first week of ownership with their infant son sitting on it. Oh, my God. Their cars were always in the shop, even though they had brands noted for their reliability. And my favorite example of their Schlamazelness, if that's even a word, was the wife bought a large poster-sized photograph of what she thought was the Golden Gate Bridge. She framed it and hung it on her living room wall. And I had to tell her, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, my gosh. So here's a woman (laughs) who both literally and figuratively bought the Brooklyn Bridge. One of the books you wrote is entitled Immortal Remains on the Evidence uh, for Life After Death. What's your general position on the topic? My general position, at least the one I reached by the time I got to the end of the book was that there is some evidence that I think is very hard to explain away, even if you take fully into account the living agent psi uh, alternative. But it's not a slam-dunk case. 
what we would need for a slam dunk case that would really mean something to the academic and scientific communities would have to be much more dramatic and uh, compelling than what we've been able to get so far. I mean, we've got some really interesting cases, some very great mediums who were able to provide very intimate kinds of details about the deceased over and over for a period of many years, like Mrs. Piper right. in America. Um, but none of these are slam dunk cases. So while I think there's some reason to believe that we survive bodily death, at least some of us do, and for not eternally, there's no evidence that we live forever. So there's some evidence that some of us seem to survive for at least a limited period of time. Is reincarnation possible? I consider that one of the options that we have to consider. Again, there are some very good uh, and intriguing mm -hmm. cases. But again, it's not easy to rule out the living agent psi alternative. And one of my disappointments with the literature on reincarnation is that the people involved in the cases are not explained in any psychological or not described in any psychological depth. So they come off as psychological stick figures, mm -hmm. and you can't really evaluate the living agent alternative unless you really dig deep under the surface. And sometimes when you do, you find out reasons for thinking that the living agent alternative is actually a very compelling one. I give a good example of that in my book, Immortal Remains. In your opinion... Is there a connection between the paranormal uh, and other facets of, of uh, parapsychology and, uh, for example, in the world of uh, alien abductions, UFO sightings, Bigfoot sightings, Loch Ness Monster, and other phenomena? Can we, can, can we lump it in, or is it associated, affiliated with the parapsychological events that seem to be going on around us at all times? It's a good question. I'm not sure. I thought you were going to ask something else. I mean, I, what I would say is that um, one of the reasons I wrote a book on multiple personality mm -hmm. was that as I was getting older or more chronologically challenged and knowing that I'd have to write a book one of these days on survival, I, I also knew that a lot of people suffering from multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder – look a lot like what you see in cases of mediumship. And so I knew I couldn't really do a decent job of evaluating the evidence for post-mortem survival until I had uh, a pretty firm grasp of the evidence uh, of, about multiplicity and the history of hypnosis and dissociation. Speaking about hypnosis, a lot of people who have uh, experienced what they believe to be an alien abduction base their, the f base their stories after they have had regressive hypnosis. Is yes. regressive hypnosis credible? It's not reliable, for sure, because yeah. it, it unleashes realms of creativity that we often didn't know we had in us. And people who are that suggestible uh, might be picking up all sorts of subtle cues. And people who seem to be regressed... Um, are, I mean, there's a lot, some very interesting cases where it looks like they're not really regressed at all. They're just simulating what they think a regressed person would look like. There have been some very careful experiments done with this by Martin Orne from Harvard. So why do a lot of people believe in hypnosis, past life regression? Once again, is this a sign of the times? Well, that's been going on for some time. And, I mean, hypnosis is not a a direct route to the truth. Mm -hmm. It's often a direct route to psychic creativity. Do I have time to tell a, a story? Yeah, we've got about a minute and a half. Okay. David Spiegel, a psychiatrist from uh, Stanford, was approached by a TV anchor woman in San Francisco. She said, um, some of these channels or mediums out here have to be genuine. And Spiegel said, show me anybody who's highly hypnotizable and I'll turn that person into a medium or a channel. And so she volunteered her cameraman. And Spiegel made this movie where he hypnotizes this cameraman and suddenly the guy changes his affect totally and he starts speaking in this flat voice as if he's an intergalactic communicator. He says something like, greetings, friends. My name is Zantac. And I hmm. bring you greetings. And... It, it doesn't show that all mediums are creative constructs, but it shows why that's not an empty issue. 
What are your final thoughts for the members of the Exo Nation tonight? Wow. Be very careful what you believe. And like I said at the beginning, belief is the strongest power in the universe. If you believe it, it'll happen. Stephen, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us. Continued success, and I would welcome the opportunity at any time to have you back on the show. Thanks very much. I look forward to that. You take care of yourself, my friend. Exonation, uh, Stephen Browdy has been our guest. He is the Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. And his uh, website is jazzphilosopher.com. And the next time uh, Stephen's with us, we'll have to ask him about his connection with jazz. This is the Exon. I am Rob McConnell. This is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. And uh, we'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue right here from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464. 